My immediate reaction was, was to cry and be angry and, and be hurt. And then I really pushed it way down in. Social problems can't be separated from the psychological problems. They cause, there's a cause and effect relationship there that's simply inseparable. There's absolute psychosocial turmoil and all of those things are totally grounded. Those are not paranoid delusions. Those are very pressing psychosocial problems that are consistent at just about every stage of the illness. There is no cure for AIDS. Its rapid spread has resulted in tremendous psychological distress for those who have the disease, for those exposed to AIDS but who have not yet developed it, for those who treat the infected, for relatives and friends of patients and caregivers, and for the public at large. Because there is no cure, the psychosocial impact of the disease is devastating. However, a knowledge of the clinical progress of the disease, its critical milestones, and the psychological distress that accompany these milestones can help those in contact with patients and infected individuals to deal with the psychological reality of this disease. AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. This term has been widely used to describe the disease itself. But AIDS is only one manifestation of infection by the human immunodeficiency virus, or HIV. HIV disease can occur in many complex and highly individual ways. The clinical course of HIV begins with risk behavior. This may result in infection. If the disease continues to progress, the first outward sign may be AIDS-related complex, or ARC. Another milestone is actual diagnosis of AIDS, referred to as frank AIDS. This occurs when either Kaposi's sarcoma or certain opportunistic infections are present. Symptom progression may be marked by periods of good health, alternating with frequent debilitating medical problems. Finally, in nearly all diagnosed AIDS cases, a period of acute terminal illness occurs, shortly followed by death. This progression varies from case to case and may vary greatly across time, but at every milestone an individual faces pressing psychosocial issues. In cities like New York or San Francisco where the topic of AIDS is well known by all, or nearly all, it is nearly universal to find a constant preoccupation with one's health and constant worries about whether one is about to develop AIDS or not. Well, basically what led up to my diagnosis uh, in the beginning was my fear because of the fact that I fell into what was then being called a, a risk group, uh, that I uh, was susceptible and also was experiencing some health problems that made me feel I had a reason to be concerned. HIV is transmitted through direct exchange of blood and body fluids. Risk behavior includes sexual contact with those who carry the virus and needle sharing in IV drug abusers. High risk contact is necessary for infection to occur. At some as yet undetermined point following infection, seroconversion takes place. The next critical psychosocial milestone is HIV antibody testing. I was at that time seeing a private physician and decided that would be a way for me to put my fears to rest. And um, was presented uh, when, I, when I went to him about this with a two-page document that explained what a positive test result could mean. I had the two-page document, I read it all over and thought, oh yeah, I can deal with that. If I get a positive result, fine. I, I know I, I can handle that. Uh, I had the test, waited um, the week or whatever it took to get the results, got my positive results and fell apart. Uh, the doctor gave me this news and that was the end of his responsibility. And I, I really was devastated. There was no way that two-page piece of paper prepared me to get a positive antibody test result. And what you might find at that time, particularly in the case of somebody finding that they are HIV antibody positive, is a crisis reaction. By this I mean somebody is at first shocked and then they are 
catastrophically stressed. Well, before you take an antibody test and when you get the results, positive or negative, you're faced with tremendous medical ambiguity. Am I really negative? When will I convert again? Uh, you know, how do I protect myself in the future? If I'm positive, am I really positive? Does this mean I'm going to get sick? What do I do to protect my lover? I feel guilty. I feel ashamed. I feel contaminated. What if my insurance company finds out? They'll cancel my insurance. If my employer finds out, I might lose my job. My friends will ostracize me. They've all seen too much grief anyway. Even my good friends, I can't pull on them. I'm going to be all alone. What do I tell my family? How am I going to pay the bills? It made me feel diseased and it made me feel very alone and and hurt and angry and in retrospect thinking back I I, I wish my doctor had been at least prepared enough to say here is the name of a good psychologist here's the name of a good therapist if you feel you need some help with these results Here's someone I know that you can talk to. I, I got none of that. Every single person who is HIV antibody positive should be notified in person, privately, with an individual clinician of their test results. They should then be questioned about their immediate response in an open-ended manner and probes should be given specifically to find out whether they feel extremely depressed, whether they feel the impulse to take their lives, whether they feel like giving up, and there should be a very detailed debriefing after this HIV test feedback about what seropositivity means and does not mean. Well, I had, I had the antibody test done on myself, and uh, I was positive. I don't know. I, don't, I do not speculate about my prognosis at all. I mean, I do occasionally read things um, in the newspaper about what percentage of uh, infected individuals will go on to ARC or AIDS. Um, the most important thing about it to me is the fact that, that with the knowledge that I have been exposed to it comes the responsibility that I must treat myself as though I am infective. And um, that's a big responsibility. After a positive antibody test, it is very possible one might be healthy and symptom-free for a period of months or years or perhaps never develop any symptoms. However, for those individuals who do develop symptoms, another critical psychosocial milestone occurs if the individual develops AIDS-related complex, or ARC. The status of individuals with ARC is highly uncertain. They may be just as sick as those diagnosed with AIDS itself, and their symptoms may also be life-threatening. Back in 1984, in the fall, uh, we were working out in the gym, and I noticed my strength was just not there and it, it uh, really became chronic um, that I just didn't have the strength to work out. I was very easily fatigued and we ran a whole bunch of tests and sure enough my T cells were extremely low and I had antibody and uh, you know at that point I knew it was just a watch and wait kind of thing and hope. That, that was ARC then and uh, I tried a whole bunch of things none of which worked if you move on over to um, subclinical disease, just malaise, fatigue, weight loss for someone, there's the lingering fear of their own mortality, the, the, the sort of Damocles hanging over their head, the time bomb feeling, when is the in infection going to come along, and a tremendous amount of denial, like Archie mentioned, that you get up and you try to go to work and keep doing your daily activities and walk around sick a long time because your only alternative is admitting that you have what you, what you believe is a terminal illness and what is essentially a terminal illness. So we can anticipate a lot of what I, I think of as practical, short-term adjustment problems. These are the kinds of problems that if they go unmonitored and if they go unattended can develop into serious crises. If they do, if they are detected early, and if we do recognize that they're happening and we get these people a little bit of help in the, in the form of brief counseling or sometimes in the form of um, anxiety management with medication, 
these problems can resolve very successfully and we can see people who are coping adaptively. And then in 1985, in, in April, someone noticed a lesion of uh, KS in my mouth. And so then I was officially AIDS. And then almost <laughs> immediately after the biopsy came down with pneumonia. The diagnosis of frank or full-blown AIDS is a critical psychosocial milestone. For such a diagnosis, Kaposi's sarcoma or opportunistic infections, such as pneumocystis pneumonia, must be present in an HIV-infected individual. Other criteria recently added by the Centers for Disease Control include emaciation and dementia. Learning that you have AIDS really is a shock, and it really does force you to re-examine your priorities and who's with you, and the meaning of your life, and it really makes you regroup your life now around having a major illness. And this can have many negative repercussions before it swings round to help you feel a sense of resolution. You have to think about how to get your practical affairs in order. You have to think about a possibly limited lifespan and you have to let go of those goals and ambitions and hopes that you wanted to achieve that you may not possibly be able to achieve now. There's an appropriate reactive depression to that. It's a very sad time and it's, and it's, and any denial one might muster to protect themselves and, and compensate and like Archie try to get about life focused tasks every time he sees another friend who's sick or dies or when he walks into his group or when he has to go to therapy every day on some protocols and go to the hospital and go to work and try to keep his energy up it's uh... it, it takes it takes remarkable adaptation and we also often focus and rightfully on the person with AIDS but those around them have tremendous tremendous needs a lover or a wife or or the, the, or a parent of someone with AIDS is constantly, their life is disrupted. I have presented myself with my illness and my sexuality to my parents. I did so in the hospital. As soon as I was diagnosed, I called them and it was the first time we'd ever discussed my sexuality. I also had to give them the news that I was diagnosed with a disease that's considered terminal. They're supportive. My, my parents came to visit me shortly after I was released from the hospital. They're not prepared to have me come there just yet. That's how I mean they have trouble. They, they, they do love me. They, do, they are there for me, but they're not ready quite yet to have me in their environment. Um, that hurts, and I've let them know that it hurts, but I'm, I'm, I'm not willing to make a wall out of that and they're not either. But it's difficult for them. I, I know it must be. It's a, it's a lifestyle they're not prepared to understand. I think they're trying. Another critical psychosocial milestone, symptom progression, involves ongoing battle with opportunistic infections. Symptoms come and go, then often are renewed with even greater intensity. Well, after I had pneumonia, I was feeling real well. Um, a lot of doctors call that the honeymoon period after the first bout of PCP. That um, I, I got my energy back and I found myself a boyfriend and I was, you know, um, I was really active. And uh, like when we first put him in the hospital with the pneumonia, I didn't think he'd be walking out. You know, I I, I was I hadn't seen it before. I didn't know what it was like. All I knew was that he was blue and not responding to the medication, you know, so I thought, well, considering how he looks and how he's acting, I don't think he's going to be walking out of here. And uh, so I had myself all geared up for his death. And then, of course, he rallied. Uh, just, yeah, like a phoenix. And this is not the, not, not the, and that is not the only time he's done it. He's done it several times. So uh, I had to completely adjust myself and that, that was that very odd time when you came home from the hospital and we had 
nothing to do. We just, <laughs> you know, we're just kind of sitting around looking at each other, you know, and I, I found myself looking at him like he was about to explode or something, waiting for him <laughs> to get sick again or, you know, and of course, he wasn't, he was fine. What happens is that any time a person with AIDS has rallied some physical strength and has beaten infection or has a regression of their symptoms, there's hope. There's the feeling that I'm going to beat this illness after all. And there can be long periods in which the person does not have symptoms that interfere with daily functioning and where he can feel relatively well so that you can well imagine the first time he again gets a major medical symptom, he feels or he's likely to feel a great deal of discouragement, a great deal of demoralization, and he can even feel panic over the return of his symptoms. I didn't work for a few months then and um, and, and, and actually became very ill again um, with fevers and, and diarrhea and weight loss and all kinds of um, symptoms like that when I was during those few months. And then in uh, April of 86, I had a um, very horrifying experience when I, when I was talking with a patient in the office, I suddenly became very confused. Um, and I really couldn't speak, I couldn't find words. Um, and I managed to s sort of stumble along and, and finish up with a patient, but I was clearly something wrong with me. And, uh, and I just called up Stephen, and I just broke down and was crying on the phone. Um, Stephen, I can't think. I just remember saying that, I can't think. Some patients may also show signs of cognitive impairment resulting from neurological involvement of HIV. This is known as AIDS dementia. Another critical psychosocial milestone, AIDS dementia can occur at any point during the disease progression, even before HIV testing. Occurrences may vary from relatively minor slowing of cognitive function to complete debilitation. The virus, um, as well as attacking T cells, can also attack nerve cells and you get a syndrome that's not unlike uh, Alzheimer's disease or senile dementia. And I've had since then a couple more, of, a couple more episodes like that. So when, when I had that episode, um, um, it, was, it was so terrifying. And, uh, and I, th I thought that that was it, that this is the harbinger of something that's going to, um, you know, then can lead to my demise. In research at Memorial, it's been demonstrated that most of the patients after autopsy, the large majority of them, have enough um, neurologic damage as a result of HIV infection to have caused clinical symptoms. We haven't always recognized those because confusion, depression, um, anxiety, maladaptive behavior, any number of things are very predictable and even appropriate responses to the incredible stress of an AIDS diagnosis or the fear of AIDS. That, of course, opens up the need for a much broader array of services. Suddenly, we have to look carefully at what our consultation and liaison psychiatry services are providing and what and how we use psychotropic medications with this patient population and uh, how we minimize the stress we add in providing their medical and mental health care. The disease process varies greatly from individual to individual and varies greatly across time. Symptoms generally increase in frequency and severity until a period of acute terminal illness is reached. I met some people there at the hospital who really helped me get through that to face my life now with this diagnosis in terms of my death. This is your prognosis based on what we know. You could live eight months to a year now, or you could live longer, you could live less. Uh, this is the average that we have now for people with pneumocystis. Um, had I made a will, uh, had I talked with my family, um, just th this whole barrage of, of the facts, and then left me for the weekend to think about this, and 
I think that more than anything really set me straight. The, the work is very difficult and, it's, and, it, and your patients relentlessly die and more and more are diagnosed every day more, are infected every day, you are presently aware of the shortcomings of educational programs, the difficulty negotiating social services, the inadequacy of medical and mental health services. It's absolutely overwhelming for anyone who does the work. GMHC can document but the entire experience for anyone caring for this many people, this young who are dying, it's a relentlessly frightening experience. And now more and more, every day, each time I go to a party, uh, each time I go into a movie, each time I walk into a clinic, I see yet more people that I have known over the years who are sick and dying. Then when I sit down to plan, say, the city of New York's mental health objectives for the next five years, and realize that millions of people are infected and millions, millions more will die before this ends. Not just a few more, my friends, millions more are going to die. I'm not really sure I can grapple consciously with those emotions. Risk behavior resulting in infection. Infection may result in the development of AIDS-related complex or a diagnosis of AIDS itself. From there, the disease proceeds via symptom progression, culminating in acute terminal illness and ultimately death. Except for these milestones, a great deal remains unknown about the clinical course of HIV disease. However, an awareness of the psychosocial milestones in the progress of the disease can make a critical difference in the quality of care for all those directly or indirectly affected by AIDS, particularly in dealing with the often immobilizing fear that accompanies it. We need to show respect for the people that we are taking care of, and we need to be able to put our own value judgments that we may exercise in our personal lives aside when we take care of patients. These patients need our help in managing their health just as much as any other groups of patients do. And gradually, we need to recognize our own discomfort as a professional problem and to work on it by education and by practice. I am trying, I am facing this disease a lot. I'm not afraid to be identified as who I am. I'm not afraid to be identified as a person with AIDS. Um, a lot of people are. When they begin to come on people with AIDS and have to treat more than just one person, when they start to see I'm doing all these things, I'm giving all these treatments for all these infections, and damn it, he died, or she's dead. And that as a healthcare professional, I could see where they might begin to feel like failures. All of my training has been geared toward, I give these drugs, I prescribe these treatments, and the person gets better, and I send them home a well-being. That's not usually the case with AIDS, and who knows when it will be the case. I have a belief that it will be someday. I hope soon. I hope before I'm dead. But it's not right now. I say present yourself, your fears, to that patient if you want to become a better healthcare professional. Uh, if you have some fears of the disease, present them to that person. I, on the receiving end of that, would be very grateful and want to really help that person help me. Some people are not going to be that way, and that's why I say it takes a really strong sense of intuition now, I think, to be a healthcare professional, but you're going to face a lot of death with this if you're a doctor, if you're a nurse. And I think this might be one way to get over that feeling of maybe a little bit of hopelessness.